These are remarkably sturdy. You can bend them back on themselves and they won't break. There you see an oscillating silicon beam. And it's using that principle that you can measure the density. So using that simple silicon microengineered sensor, you have the basis of a novel gas meter. I have behind me here a setup to demonstrate to you that it really does work. At the very end of this tip here, I have the silicon flow sensor, very similar to the one that you've just seen there. This is only a prototype device, and so there's quite a lot of electronics attached to it. In a year or so's time, that will be shrunk down to the size of a small silicon chip. And the whole of the gas sensor will fit into a gas pipe, one inch in diameter. This type of sensor has been positioned in this block here. And what I'd like now is for the volunteer to help me demonstrate this gas sensor. Would you like to come and help me? What's your name? Peter. Peter. Hello, Peter. Let's see if you can help me do this demonstration here. What we're going to do is to pretend that we have a gas flow. Yeah. And this fan here, yeah. what I'd like you to do is to switch it on for me. That's it. So that's going to, we're going to pretend that that's our fan. And if I just switch the computer on here, what we'll see on the screen here is a plot here of the signal strength. This will measure the flow of gas, and this is time. And as you see, your fan is moving around, the wind velocity is changing. As it comes down this tube here, that's, you can see it's changing. And what I'd like you to do is to put a card in the way, and let's see if you can kill it altogether. You see, you've cut it down to nothing. If you take it away again, we should see it going back up. So it really does work, doesn't it? Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for helping, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> so now we can draw the bridge of technology for the microelectronic gas meter. Advances in thermodynamics, crystallography, our understanding of the silicon crystallography has enabled microengineering of silicon chips, not just for the electronics, but for the sensor as well. And the driving forces from the home have been security in the home and those accurate and remote meter readings. Now let me return to this etching experiment that I set into motion about 10 minutes ago. We've been etching a piece of silicon and if you remember, we had an array all shaped in that circular fashion. And what I want to do now is to switch on the microscope and we'll see what shape they are now. You see, they've been transformed into squares. What is difficult for you to see, obviously, is that we've etched pits into the silicon. But to try and demonstrate that to you, I'll shine a light into the area here, and we might see some of the inverted hexagons, inverted, there you are, see them? Those are the pyramids, the inverted pyramids, showing that we really have pits there. Earlier today, we carried out a similar experiment, and it's interesting looking at a time sequence of those rings gradually moving into squares. The whole sequence takes about 10 or 15 minutes. You can see the square starting there. Using different etchants, you can get different etching rates. Typically here, we're talking about two micrometers per minute etching. You can see some of the three-dimensional effects here as we move, move more and more down into the pits. It's a very nice real-time example of what you can do with silicon and some innovative chemistry. My third illustration of where silicon is useful in the home is related to computers. The computer was invented by Charles Babbage very early on last century. Babbage invented a computer we now call a difference engine. It didn't have a memory. 
von Neumann, just before the war, the Second World War, invented the idea of a stored program in a computer. And shortly after the Second World War, we had the first generation of computers. Huge, huge buildings were needed to accommodate them. The computers had lots and lots of valves that required special heating and so on. In the early 60s, the transistor was really a commercial product, and that made computers much more reliable and a little bit more compact, but they still required special buildings. The third generation of computers came with the integrated circuit. And then we saw computers shrinking, and many computers came in, and then microcomputers. Now we have large-scale integration on silicon chips, and this means that you can buy small desktop computers that are extremely powerful, much more powerful than those housed in huge buildings after the end of the Second World War. The next generation of computers is going to be very radically different to the previous four. The previous four relied on changes in technology, refinements in the basic technology. But the fifth generation of computers is going to rely on a totally novel architecture to the computer. The von Neumann type computers involve sequential processing. You had a processor, you had a memory, and you had to shunt information between the two. And there's a bottleneck there. But parallel computers are with us now. This is where you have more than one processor, and you're able to carry out certain tasks very, very efficiently. I have here a special integrated circuit. This is called a transputer. It really is a computer on a chip, complete with a processor, the memory, and the communication links. It really is the first device in the world to capitalize on parallel processing. That little transputer there is equivalent to 20 BBC microcomputers, to give you some idea of its power. And one BBC computer typically has 32 kilobytes of memory. So there is one board involving a transputer. These are all the memory chips. What I have here is a supercomputer. And I genuinely mean a super, supercomputer. What we've done here is to link together 32 of those transputer boards that I've just described. And that gives you enormous computing capacity. There are many, many large computers in Britain. But if you had two of these linked together, and that's easily done, it would be equivalent to one of the very, very biggest computers in this country. So it capitalizes on the parallel processor. To try and show you just how powerful they are and how good they are at doing real-time processing, what I've simulated here is a drum, the membrane of a drum being struck with a stick. It's a very, very complicated physics problem because what I'm going to try and show you are the various waveforms when they're reflected from the size of the skin. So if we can set this going, you can see there the drum, it's hit the center, the wave is propagating out, and very quickly we're going to get these reflections. Now we've got some appropriate music to go with it. You see these beautiful shapes, these highly complex waveforms. It would take a normal computer hours, perhaps weeks, to calculate the equivalent information.
that supercomputer used boards just like this. The next generation of supercomputers will contain the same type of power, but in boards much, much smaller. So the whole thing will become very, very compact. Here you see the transputer, and there are four sets of memory chips there. Now that particular demonstration would have been well suited to my lecture on music in the home. Let me now show you a different application of the supercomputer in the home environment. You can use it for scene visualization. This again requires very complex programming. What it enables the architect to do is to sketch in exactly the shape of room that he wants. Put in the diffuse light sources that he wants. And then, by using a technique we call radiosity, he can look at the various shadowing effects, the effects of a blue wall on a green carpet and so on. And if he wants to, he can change the position of those lamps. And he can also orient himself at different positions in the room. Now, this is a highly complex task, but it's going to be an enormous benefit to the person designing a home. A second example to show you is in the kitchen. Here's a simulated kitchen. And now we're going to switch on a light in this corner here, and we can see the effect of that light. And then we'll put lights on in different other, other different parts of that kitchen. This is a highly complex problem to solve, but this super, super computer can really do that without too much difficulty. Now let me change tack a little bit, but still talk about interior decoration. Lighting is a very important feature in the home, but so is paint. Here is a rainbow. All the colours there. The, there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation between wavelength and the colour sensation we experience. Most of you would say that red and green were very, very different colours, and the purple was closer to red. But as you can see, in terms of wavelength, that isn't the case. I have here a colour wheel. We have the three primary colours, red, blue and green. If you mix those three primary colours, and we can do that using this old experiment that Rayleigh first showed in the Royal Institution, you get white. If you had those phosphors on a television screen, they would be these three here. If you wanted a yellow colour, you'd mix red and green. But paint doesn't work according to the additive laws of colour. Let us suppose that you want to see yellow paint. Well, that paint has to absorb in the blue part of the spectrum. You have white light, it hits the paint, the blue is absorbed, and that means that the green and the red are reflected, and therefore you will see yellow. And so for paint, it's subtractive colours that are important, not additive colours. What I'd like to do now is, with the help of Gordon here, is to show you how useful the computer can be in helping you select your paint. We have here a unique instrument in the United Kingdom. Only part of it is here. Outside, we have the paint maker. And that contains a colour wheel very similar to the one I've just shown you. I'd like an assistant to help me with this experiment. Would you like to come down? What's your name? Robert. Hello, Robert. Now, what I'd like you to do, if you can just stand here for a second, this is a very, very important part of this machine because it can detect very accurately the colour of any of your garments, say this nice purple sweater you have. And if we place that close to this spectro spectrometer here, it can work out just what combination of paint is required 
to give you this nice color here. So would you like to put your sweater in there, right? Don't be afraid of it, it's perfectly safe. Right, just stay there for a second. And Gordon can now, with the aid of the computer, calculate just what percentages of red, green, yellow, whatever, will give you this color. When we've calculated the mix, what I'll ask you to do is to go out with Gordon and we'll get the paint maker going and then you can come back later and tell us just how close it is. Okay, let me just disconnect you then. Right, off you go and then come back whenever your paint is ready. Well, while they're out, let me just demonstrate to you some recent advances in paint technology. Water, as we know, is thin and sloppy. Treacle, on the other hand, well, as you can see, is very gooey and thick, isn't it? And a jelly wobbles. Modern paint wobbles as well. It has a constitution much closer to jelly than to either of these two here. This is a very viscous material, and this is less viscous. With jelly, it's a bit more complicated to explain the rheology of this material here. But if I take a piece out here, it's a bit like thick custard or blancmange or jelly. But the important thing is when I squeeze it, you can see it forms a much less viscous fluid. And you can paint with that. And that's because there's a special ingredient in this paint. And it's a certain compound we call a chelate. There's a certain type of oxygen-hydrogen bond there that breaks very, very easily when you put force on it. But as soon as you relax that force, it wants to join together again, and so you get the solid paint. And so that really is an advantage. In principle, I could put that paint pot over my head, but I won't. <laughs> Another very recent innovation is the dyeing of carpets or curtains. You can see here a rather bland colored set of fibers. In here, there are more than one type of fiber. One type of fiber here attracts cationic dyes. Another kind attracts ionic dyes. And so this means that if you put a mix of dyes into a pot, the cationic, anionic, certain colors will attract to certain parts of the fiber and others to other parts. And you can see here some examples where this has been dipped into black, red, and blue dye, all mixed together. It really is a very, very spectacular thing to do, where you take this kind of fiber, and dip it in, and lo and behold, you end up with these nice patterns here. We call this differential dyeing. Well, I wonder whether those paint makers have actually succeeded yet in making their paint. Ah, excellent. Has it worked? Oh, that looks good. That looks good. Is that a good color mask? Isn't that clever? I've suddenly gone from talking about the inorganic element silicon and I'm now talking about organic molecules. You and I are made out of organic molecules. And for the remainder of my lecture, I want to mention my own particular research field, molecular electronics. I have here some photochromic dyes. They've actually come from the University of Wales at Cardiff, so we can call them dyes dyes. What I want you to see now is what happens when I shine ultraviolet light on these dyes. The black section here is a stencil. So I'm now shining ultraviolet light onto this very carefully engineered molecule. And if I move the stencil, you'll see that I've left a message behind. So these photochromic materials they respond to the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. But using white light, you see, you can erase them. 
And so here you've got a very simple principle that can be used for information storage. You write information with one wavelength, you erase it with another. And based on these photochromic dyes, it's very likely that you'll see real innovations in information storage. It might be useful in electronic paper or in optical tape recorders, for example. But clearly, there's something there that silicon couldn't do that an organic molecule can. Behind me here, I have a few more examples of molecular electronics. The first I want to refer to is a piezoelectric polymer, a pressure-sensitive polymer. And I'd like an assistant to help me with this. Would you like to help me? What's your name? Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Come down and let's see if you can help me here. This is a security mat. What I'd like you to do is to squeeze down on it and let's see what happens. There, you see? You've set the bell going, the alarm bell. That's exactly what a burglar would do if he stood on that mat. Let's see if this one here works as well. What I want you to do is to bend this here. Again, this is the piezoelectric polymer on the surface. But remember, it's an organic material, just like you. And it could have feelings. And what I want you to do is to watch that screen as you bend this. So will you bend that? Oh, <laughs> see what it says? Try again. Oh, you see? It really is organic, isn't it? Yes. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. <laughs> Safety in the home is important. And I have here a commercial smoke detector. It's very, very important for detecting fires. In a fire, as well as smoke, you have hydrogen. And what I have alongside me here is a hydrogen detector. The important part is all in this little tiny area here. This is where we have a hydrogen sensor. And it's a very modern sensor. It combines the virtues of molecular electronics with microelectronics. We have a silicon wafer there that contains a special organic material. Because in a sensor, you require not just sensitivity, but selectivity. And what we can do here is to tailor make a molecule that will just respond to a particular gas, in this case, hydrogen. Equally well, I could have a sensor that detected methane, but in that case, I'd have a different organic material inside. What I want to do now, using this KIPS apparatus here, is to produce some hydrogen. I'll put it near the detector. And then, if you look at this screen here, you'll be able to see, I hope, a signal. There we are. So that type of detector is much more efficient than the conventional one, and it gives you much more advanced warning that there is a fire. My next illustration of molecular electronics concerns this television here. I have referred to it earlier in my lectures. This is a liquid crystal television. Instead of your cathode ray oscilloscope that you would have, or the cathode ray tube in a conventional television, what we have here is a display containing liquid crystal molecules. Liquid crystals are a very, very interesting kind of material. Here is a conventional crystal. In this bottle here, I have a liquid crystal. It has some of the properties of a solid, and some of a liquid. Liquid crystals were discovered about a century ago by a person called Lehman. Their fascinating property is that they can change the polarization of light. And if you apply a voltage to them, that also changes the plane of polarization. 
And I have a simple experiment here to show that to you. I have two pieces of Polaroid, and in between, I have a liquid crystal cell. And I've put a special pattern on that, a certain electrode. What I'm going to do now is to apply a small voltage, only about one and a half volts, and what we should see is that plane of polarization changing, and you should be able to see an interesting character. There he is, an old Welsh sheepdog. <laughs> Let me say a few words more about liquid crystals, and I'll do so with the use of the slides. The type of molecule that you have in your liquid crystal television is this one here. Let me now show that switching sequence. I've just applied a voltage, and that switches on the liquid crystal display. So down here, we're seeing the display. And as you can see, when you switch on the voltage, it switches on. On the other hand, as soon as the voltage goes off, down it goes again. Pulse it again, up it goes, down it goes. It responds very quickly to the voltage. But in a television set, you've got thousands of pixels on the front of a liquid crystal television set, and some of them you'll want to keep on for much longer than this time frame. And so what we do to do that, here are the pixels, we position in the corner of the pixel a tiny transistor. I can show it in close-up here. These are the individual pixels on the liquid crystal screen. And this dark shadow here is a thin film transistor which is positioned behind. And that's to enable the liquid crystal to stay on. You need that transistor there. This is rather inconvenient and very difficult to fabricate. And therefore, a new kind of liquid crystal has been invented to overcome this problem. It's a much more complicated molecule. We call it a ferroelectric liquid crystal. The interesting thing about it is it has a memory. And so this time the switching sequence is rather different. I'm now going to apply voltage pulses in the plus direction and in the opposite direction. And let's now see the effect. If you switch on, the display switches on. But now, you'll notice it stays on. Even though the voltage has come down, this stays on, so it has a memory. In order to switch it off, you apply a voltage in the opposite direction. Down it goes. Pulse it again, up it goes, but it stays on. The additional benefit of this is it switches very, very quickly, about 100 times faster than the normal liquid crystal. Now, why is that such an advantage? Here's your small liquid crystal display. It's possible that we might get displays of this kind up to maybe a foot in size. But you're probably not going to get much larger displays than that. And that's because of the complication of putting all these thin film transistors onto the display. What we want is one meter size televisions. That's the size of television screen that we want. And there's no way that existing liquid crystal technology will do it for you. But ferroelectric liquid crystals will. Because now you no longer need that transistor. All you require is very, very flat glass coated with a certain electrode pattern. Because they switch so quickly, you can have all different colored lights underneath flashing away. It's so much more simple to make a display of this kind. And so when the flat panel display comes, it'll be based on ferroelectric liquid crystals. And we'll have just this type of aspect